Thank you very much. Thanks for that kind introduction. And more importantly, thank you for letting me come and talk to this great group of Americans. Americans who, like me, love liberty. It's a pleasure to be with you, and it's an honor. We as Americans have received as our birthright an understanding that too often gets neglected. It's the understanding that is the legacy of our forefathers. The understanding that whenever government acts, it does so at the expense of individual freedom, of our own liberty. Sometimes we lose track of that. And we especially tend to lose track of it when it comes to that undeniable link between economic freedom and individual personal liberty. The two are inextricably intertwined in a way that we can't dispute, in a way that we can't deny. And in a way that uh, when we forget about it, tends to promote the inexorable expansion of the government at the expense of our individual liberty and at the expense of our economic prosperity. Because the two can't be separated. And when we try to pretend that they can, bad things happen. The only way I believe that we're going to find ourselves getting out of this malaise economically and of the intrusion into our individual liberty has to do with renewing the emphasis on the entire concept of constitutionally limited government and on restoring principles of fiscal restraint, uh, regulatory reform, and right now also bringing about policies that will promote increased production of our domestic energy resources. We have to develop those resources if we're going to be able to restore what we need to America. But as I introduce some of these concepts, I'd like to share with you uh, one of my favorite quotes. This is a, a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville, something that he wrote in, 19, in 1848, observing uh, a, a phenomenon that we've seen come to fruition in our lifetime, uh, observing a phenomenon that even in 1848 he could understand them. That there is a tendency that some people have to equate freedom with something else. And that something else is something that while masquerading as freedom and while having some slimmer of commonality with freedom is actually the polar opposite of freedom. Let me explain by quoting de Tocqueville. He said, democracy extends the sphere of individual freedom. Socialism restricts it. Democracy attaches all possible value to each man. Socialism makes each man a mere agent, a mere number. Democracy and socialism have nothing in common but one word, equality. But notice the difference. While democracy seeks equality and liberty, socialism seeks equality in restraint and servitude. There is a difference, and the difference is everything. So when we have a country that's up in arms over the fact that the federal government would offer a loan guarantee to a company that ended up going bankrupt. People get upset about the fact that the company went bankrupt. They get upset about the fact that the company had ties to the current presidential administration and to uh, some political allegiances that exist within that administration. I respectfully submit, however, that they ought to get just as upset. They got, ought to get even more upset at the underlying phenomenon, which is government getting into the business of choosing winners and losers in the marketplace, in the marketplace of ideas and in the marketplace of free exchange. That's the problem, separate and apart from and regardless of what happens to the underlying business enterprise, when government in the name of equality gets into things, when it sinks its sharp claws and its extensive and very flexible tentacles into every aspect of human existence, our individual liberty suffers, and with our individual liberty, so goes our economic prosperity, because the two cannot be separated. Friedrich Hayek expanded a little bit on this principle that Alexis de Tocqueville penned so very well in 1848. To Hayek, um, this principle goes one step further. He explained to the great, of, the great apostles of political freedom the word meant freedom from coercion, freedom from the arbitrary power of other men, release from the ties which left the individual no choice but obedience 
to the orders of a superior to whom he was attached. The new freedom promised, however, that the, the, the new freedom promised, however, was to be freedom from necessity, freedom from the compulsion of the circumstances which inevitably limit the range of choice of all of us, although for some very much more than for others. Before man could truly be free, according to this socialist mindset, the despotism of physical want had to be broken and the restraints of, economic, of the economic system had to be relaxed. Hayek continues, there can be no doubt that the promise of greater freedom has become one of the most effective weapons of socialist prog propaganda and that the belief that socialism would bring freedom is genuine and sincere. But this would only heighten the tragedy if it should prove that what was promised to us as the road to freedom was in fact the high road to servitude. And indeed it is. This is something that we find consistently is that what big government offers to us as expanding freedom actually does quite the opposite. And that the form of freedom offered to us by big government is in fact something that will make us less free and that it shares in common with true freedom, with individual liberty, only one thing, that is equality. But in one circumstance, equality is expressed in the negative. We're all chained together at the bottom left as the subjects of an all-powerful sovereign. In another circumstance, we're all free. We're all free as, to climb as high as we possibly can, as high as the desires of our heart will take us, and as high as our circumstances, our skill, and the effort we put into life might permit. In that circumstance, every one of us truly becomes more free. Every one of us truly becomes more prosperous, more successful, more able to do that which we were intended to do, more able to achieve that status which Almighty God would choose to bestow upon us as our everlasting gift from heaven. None of this can be accomplished, however, when we have a government that knows no boundaries. Now, our founding fathers understood these principles well. They aren't new to us today. They weren't new to Alexis de Tocqueville when he wrote some of these words in 1848. They weren't new to our founding fathers when they chose to revolt against what they saw as the same kind of government or a government sharing at least some of the same characteristics that we face today. In the 1770s, starting with the early 1770s, we had in our forebearers a certain frustration with an all-powerful sovereign national government. That all-powerful national sovereign government was based far from the people. It was based not in Washington, D.C. That didn't exist then. It was based in London. That all-powerful national sovereign government taxed its people too much. It regulated them too heavily. And it didn't respect the needs of the people. It was slow to respond to their needs, in part because it was so distant from them. That's exactly why our founding fathers, when it came time for them to put together a government, when they convened in Philadelphia in that faithful s uh, summer of 1787, they realized that large national governments that have no boundaries around their authority inevitably are likely to become tyrants. And that can be true, as we've discovered, regardless of whether the national government in question is headed, on the one hand, by a king, or on the other hand, by an elected president. Or, as we've seen more recently, by an elected president who thinks he's a king. What we had in the founders then was a group of wise and I believe inspired men who recognized a very simple idea. If we're going to have a national government, which we need to have, because there are some things that only a national government can do. But if we're going to have one, we need to draw a very careful boundary around it to make sure that that authority doesn't extend so far that it results in tyranny. So they came up with a document, and within that document, they came up with a list of powers that must be exercised at the national level. That list included a few basic things like providing for our national defense, 
establishing a system for immigration and naturalization, establishing a uniform system of weights and measures, coining money. Notice they said pointing, not printing. We may get to that a little later if we have time. Declaring war, novel concept. Regulating trade between the states and the foreign nations. You notice they didn't say Congress will have the power to regulate anything that in turn affects trade between the states and with foreign nations. They said regulating commerce between the states and foreign nations. That meant trade. We'll get to that a little bit later as well. Then there's my all-time favorite power of Congress, the power to grant letters of mark and reprisal. It's essentially a hall pass issued by Congress in the name of the United States government that says whoever holds this may engage in state-sponsored acts of piracy on the high seas in the name of the United States. One day I'm going to get myself a letter of mark and reprisal. <laughs> I've invited my friend Rand Paul, who incidentally has uh, become uh, perhaps my best friend of the U.S. Senate and, uh, and is a truly delightful individual in addition to being the champion of individual liberty that he is. I've invited Rand to join me on my pirate ship and when I get my letter of mark and reprisal, you can join me. <laughs> but that's about it. This list is finite. It's limited. It truly is limited government, although we've converted this concept to a truism a naked, transparent truism that isn't really true anymore, it's still here. The powers are limited. There is no power in this document to tell Americans where to go to the doctor and how to pay for it. There is no power in this document to make everything in life fair and equal in terms of our economic outcomes. While this can, in many respects, be fairly described as an economic document, it exists not for the purpose of ensuring economic outcomes, but for the purpose of assuring economic opportunities made possible by our individual liberties that are so sacredly and importantly guarded by this document to the extent we will follow it, to the extent we will allow it to work its magic. So what happened? Well, we got lost along the way. We adhered rather rigidly to the precepts of limited government outlined in this document the document that fostered the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known. For the better part of 150 years, we entered some rocky times toward the first half of the last century. Rocky, rocky times that I believe were made even more rocky than they had to be as a result of some failed governmental policies, as a result of some decisions made by some people some of which were arguably started during a fateful trip to Jekyll Island, <laughs> that produced massive inflation that allowed for our national debt to go from about $2.6 billion in 1910 to $26 billion in 1920. Part of what's facilitated that was the establishment of the Federal Reserve Bank and the massive inflationary activities that we chose to undertake pursuant to that mechanism that facilitated our funding of World War I and it facilitated our massive acquisition of debt. Now, not surprisingly, that led to hyperinflation. It led to some rather significant inflation, which then had to be controlled after World War I ended and the Federal Reserve took steps to control that the economy got back sort of on a semi-stable uh, plane in, in the 1920s. We started being successful again, but there were some underlying instabilities that led to the stock market crash of 1929. That stock market crash, in turn, gave rise to a massive recession that was made even worse by more of the same problems that got us into the underlying crisis to begin with. <laughs> 